you know, Muslims are 2 billion people on the face of the earth. I mean, this is like, we're saying that if you don't allow the ceasefire, that it will create a rift and a problem in the society. This was one day before I went and see Piers Morgan. I was on top of a big car. Hamza Zorsis was driving it and I was a bit, a little bit worried. And I sat there, I told the guy to wait in the car and I sat there for a bit and I was scared actually. Fame and money and power, all three of those things. When I was younger, in fact, I was listening to the Dawah and then there was one particular notable speaker and he was very dismissive. And I have to give Amr Suleiman credit. Alim, I, I recognize Alim not just from his Alim and his Taqwa, but from the Mawaqif, from issues like this. This can make or break Alim's career. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu alhamdulillah. We are honored to have a very esteemed guest, Muhammad Hijab, who I've had the pleasure of spending the last, what, five days or so with. Um, not as much time together as I'd like, but yeah. alhamdulillah, um, enough to, to, to benefit myself and to appreciate you in a new, in a new role. Cause sometimes people only see the person who's in front of the people and on the camera. And then when you just like Amr ibn Khattab said, you don't know someone truly until you travel with them or you do business with them, or you live next to them. And so in the small way of, of traveling together, doing da'wah together, you get to see a new dimension of people and you get to appreciate them even more. So Barakallah Fiqh, and thank you so much for, for joining us. I don't know whether that's a positive or negative, in my yeah, It's a positive, akhi. it's a positive. Akhi. Yeah. No, definitely. I mean, yeah. we're all human beings at the end of the day. Yeah. I have my more than my fair share of shortcomings, hmm. you know, but we see how we fit together and we have the same goals. And we yeah, have the 100%. same. Yeah, you know, alhamdulillah. 100%. Um, so very recently you were on the Piers Morgan show, um, in, a, a, an interview that has gone viral. One of the most viewed of his channel, um, broke the web, as some people say, um, I'm wondering, you know, because when you go into it, you have a plan and then it happens and then you have reflections after it. I'm wondering about, um, your reflections about how that interview went, first of all, and then seeing how many pro-Palestinian voices were continued to be allowed on the show. Um, how does this fit into our strategy to change the discourse on Palestine? So I, I knew from watching Piers Morgan that he had heavy hands and glass jaw, um, which kind of to put this in, what I mean by that is that he asks questions, but he's not really good at answering questions. Yes. And obviously an interviewer or a journalist is not really trained really as such as how to answer questions. Yes. Um, so my strategy going in was uh, to effectively uh, disarm him really quickly because I knew what the, everyone knew what the question was going to be that he's going to ask about the condemnation. Of course. And this condemnation, some Muslim people are like, why did you condemn? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a very small number of people. Uh, but uh, we actually condemn it because if there's some aspects of people killing civilians, non-combatants, the Prophet ﷺ forbade it. Sorry, sir. It's really as simple as that. Yeah. And there's no jama'ah, there's no uh, group or anybody that is above uh, the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's many hadiths, I mean, uh, to that particular effect. Um, uh, when the Prophet, you know, put us in charge of a particular uh, army, that and la naqtula walidan, you know, la numathilu wala. There's many hadiths like this, and the woman that got killed, to not to kill a child, I haven't translated, not to kill a child, not to kill a... So these are there. Obviously, we're not saying that the children were being killed, of course, right, yeah. Of course, yeah. Uh, th these are things that still have to be verified. Um, it's a claim. Uh, but I'm saying that if, and that's what was being said here, if that, that did happen, at any time anything like that does happen, we condemn it. Uh, this is we have no problem because we have a gharad dawi. At the end of the day, people cannot think that as Muslim people that this is what we believe in. It's tashwih right. dawa, yes, and tashwih al Islam actually. Right, and the, the greater maqsad, right, is that we're we're trying to make Islam um, apparent and manifest. We're trying to spread Islam, and so yeah. you know you can't lose it through the weeds. What Islam actually says. Yeah, Islam is clear about this, actually, to be fair. And so, Ijma'a al Imam al Arba, this is actually uh, not a controversial matter. Yeah. And the, the other hadith, for example, and Muttafaqun uh, in Bukhari Muslim, is when the woman was seen killed, she said, mm -hmm. for example. So, if anyone does that, and I'm not just saying that as a lip service, we do course, genuinely yeah. believe that. So, I came in thinking, oh, well, I've got, do I condemn if this and that happened? If that happened, yeah, well, of course we condemn. Yeah. So we dis so my strategy with that was to disarm him very quickly and then to ask him the same question. Uh -huh. So we're gonna play condemnation politics. Yeah. As I said, he's got heavy hands, but he's got a glass chin, 
or glass jaw. And as soon as he started getting the questions, he started seeing his body language change. Yeah. And people are not used to seeing Piers Morgan on the back foot. People are not used to seeing the counter attack. People are not used to seeing him hesitating and not answering the question directly, being asked questions in that way. I don't think he was uh, used to it or that he actually had anything like that before. Yeah. So um, after that, I mean, there was lots of things we discussed, but what was clear from this whole thing was that he was incapable. He used all the words he wanted to. Tragic, uh, all this kind of, I mourn, all this, but he did not use the word condemn, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which lead, or led a lot of people and still lead a lot of people to say, okay, why is he not condemning Israel for these attacks? And there, so then people have made all kinds of videos and analyses on the back of this saying, well, actually he's connected to Rupert Murdoch, who owns TalkSport, I think is the name of the channel. He owns that organization. And Rupert Murdoch is invested in, in other Zionist causes. Uh, himself, I don't know if he's, he's an open Zionist or not. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, of course, a member of the Jewish community, but not every member of the Jewish community is a Zionist. Of course. Um, some of them anti-Zionist, in fact. But, uh, yeah, so people have put things together like that and connected him yeah. with, with that. And so the reason why he's not, speaking out about this matter, even though it's so morally objectionable, is because uh, it's it's connected, all these kind of videos have come out. Mm -hmm. uh, and this has shown us the importance of social media and the alternative narrative, because if uh, MSM or the mainstream media is going to have such a skewed analysis based on the political interests, uh, which many people think this is the case, the political interests of people and how much money they're willing to accept, then uh, we need an alternative. And uh, the Muslims have now found that alternative. Yeah, mashallah. No, it seemed like, and, and all the commentary I've heard from you about the interview, it, it, it seems like you were very well prepared and very intentional with how you approached the interview. And that's very commendable. I think it was very important. You know, Talal Asad um, has a quote about the freedom of speech. A lot of people misunderstand it as just the freedom to say something, but he says there's freedom of speech is irrelevant without the freedom to be heard, mm -hmm. right? And so there needs to be some sort of discursive intervention, stirring up, breaking, you know, um, the status quo in order to create the space to be heard. And it seems like that was an effect of, of how you approached it because you really did, you know, we're used to seeing him slither away with sort of, you know, platitudes and, and lies and culpa mia sort of, uh, it's not my, you know, not my place, not my place, but you really actually did corner him and put him in a position where it looked embarrassing that he didn't um, do the normal bait and switch and, you know, throw his hands up and then switch to another question. So I think that was, that was very um, effective. Um, when it comes to the the other speakers, um, you know, we had Basim Yusuf, we had other other people that were on that were pro-Palestinian voices. Um, uh, I think that what you just said is very, very key about the alternative media. Someone asked me a question last night, and I'd like to see your um, response to it. They said, Israel, the nation of Israel, the government and the Zionist sort of, um, you know, um, elements of it have been extremely effective in institutional capture. Right, infiltrating institutions at a high level, um, you know, um, let's say targeted pressure, lobbying, etc. Why don't we do the same? Okay, and my response was, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about it. People resent that. You know, if you look actually now at the tide that is turning, like you said, with social media, how we've been able to push back and expose these lies, illuminate and put a, a show a spotlight on these connections and these moneyed interests and this, these biases. People actually resent it if you're not actually on the side of truth, if you're just trying to play the game and manipulate and work behind closed doors and capture institutions to use them for your sort of thing. What we're seeing is a much more popular mass uprising of um, distrusting the mainstream media, trying to find out the truth. Um, would you agree with that analysis, first of all? I think it's true that people, um, I mean, there's lots of books written on the Israel lobby. I think John Mearsheimer has a famous book called The Israel Lobby. John Mearsheimer seen as like one of the uh, top figures of international relations. And um, and they speak about how like the, the sorry, the Zionist lobby, lobby mm -hmm. inf you know, influences senators and, uh, uh, you know, members of the House of Representatives, etc. in America and other places in the world, but specifically America. And... Um, that's a strategy that has, to some extent, been working. According to international relations scholars, there's a difference of opinion as to is this effect uh, 
direct or if it's, is it not? Is it more exaggerated in our understanding or not? But what's clear to me, as I think you alluded to, is that this, for us to establish a position or a placement like this, uh, with uh, political representatives in America, it would take more than a generation. Right. Because the, the, you've got to look at the apparatus of, um, like, uh, for example, politics in, in the United States of America, in the United Kingdom, what kind of political system structures we've got in place, and what it takes to actually influence things to a, a legislative level. So if, we, for example, we look at the House of Representatives and the Senate, the Senate there's two, I mean, the way in the United States and uh, it works, the legislature is divided into two houses. Yeah. Now, really, the senators have more pound for pound weight than House of Representatives. Now, to, to not just influence the senators, but to influence the executive branch of government, which, frankly, senators can have that influence as well, of course. And some of the things that the executive branch of government, the president, will require approval from the Senate and from the House of Representatives. It will require what what kind of money we're talking about here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're talking about uh, it's going to go, it's going to cross the maybe the trillion mark, really, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just to get our voice heard. And and we're competing with a lobby that's well established. Right. Um, it's it's an inefficient use of resources. The same thing applies with the United Kingdom. We've got six hundred thirty six. Um, chair or called um, chairs or seats in in uh, House of Commons, and then you have uh, what was then called the House of Lords. You've got once again two chambers. House of Lords doesn't really have a power. Most MPs don't have power to affect law, especially not law relating to foreign policy decision making. To get to a position where you're going to affect that, in here in Canada where we are, there's 136 seats or 126 seats. I just had a conversation with an MPP. They call them MPPs. I'm not sure, you, I'm not sure if you were there or not. I, I, it was a particular I MPP, and and I was having a conversation with her. They they all got party whips. They've all got you know. This it's very difficult to to influence the situation. You need a lot of money, right? And you need a lot of time, and you need to have a lot of connections. And it's it's not easy to just establish yourself. Come and say I want to have a conversation with such and such a person, and. It's, these things are well established and have been for a very long time. As you mentioned, therefore, I mean, the strongest and quickest and best, wh where our strengths are as Muslim people is our numbers. Yeah. Now, our Muslims are 2 billion people on the face of the earth. I mean, this is like, according to Pew, 25%. Clearly, that's what the strength is. So um, a mass kind of movement, whether we use the internet or any other medium, protest action, whatever it may be, that's clearly... Um, getting the attention of the politicians. It's changing the tone of a journalist. It's changing the tone of uh, UN representatives and it's changing the tone of everyone. Uh, us raising awareness, the public opinion war, the information war, that is clearly where our strength lies. If we think we're going to influence things by trying a strategy effectively that's not ours, and, and number two, which is not even effective, or yeah. there's no proof of concept for it, right. I don't think that's the way to go at this stage. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, it's interesting to me, one of the reflections I've had is that we're seeing almost a replay of what happened before the escalation in Palestine with the trans lobby, right? Because the trans lobby had a very similar institutional capture. Mm. They didn't really focus so much on uh, affecting mass opinion. It wasn't a mass movement, right? It was something that they tried to get, um, you know, their folks in think tanks and academia and politicians and school boards they kind of unilaterally, right, asserted or imposed a certain curriculum in the schools and look at how much resentment mm. it, it, it resulted in. They almost, just like the Zionists, I think, have overplayed their hand, you know, before this was happening, I think the trans movement was overplaying its hand mm. and it resulted in a huge black backlash. So I think that, yeah, no, I do agree. I think that that we have, um, if you were due to like a SWOT analysis, right, your strengths and your weaknesses, et cetera, um, are, I don't think that strategy aligns with what we've got and it might take too long, and there might be some um, some undesirable consequences uh, to it. That being said, you know, uh, before I was a Muslim, I was a part of many sort of um, protest movements and these sorts of things. One of the difficulty, one of the difficulties of this particular moment in time, we have momentum, we have a certain toolbox that we're using. Okay, we've got we're we're getting body blows in at this point with yourself and others on major, um, you know, um, 
major platforms. We're also got, you know, a mass movement pushing back the narrative. We've caused major uh, media organizations to apologize, to retract. We've seen the change in language, like you said, even the State Department of the United States they started finally to change the language around where things are going. One of the difficulty of social movements is making a list of demands and figuring out what the end game is, right? Where are we going? Like, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts about this. What are we calling for? How far do we keep pushing? What's realistic and what should we be asking for? And is there anything else that we're going to have to do in order to get there? Well, the short term is that we're obviously calling for a ceasefire in terms of the attacking of civilians. Yes. It's not just on the basis of um, kind of pleading or something. We're, we're saying that this actually is not in the interest of the Western powers for you to allow the unruly boy, the child. Yes. Yes, that is called Israel because that's what it is. It's like, you know, it's a child of uh, the, the United States of Amer America and maybe the UK together. They've come together in one night stand and <laughs> produced this unruly b bastard, sorry to say, child. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, they're, they're let, the way I see it is that they're letting him get too naughty. They're getting him get to let him do whatever he wants. No accountability. No accountability. He can do what he wants. And the thing is, is that the the United States of America knows full well that this is not in their best interest. Mm -hmm. How could it be in their best interest when they're trying to stabilize the region? Because if by stabilizing it in a certain way, which allows their own hegemony to take place and for them to have their own basis and their own transactions and their own capitalistic interests, this is not going to do, it's not going to help. Yeah. So by by allowing Muslim people and Arab people across the Muslim world to be outraged by the situation, they're threatening instability in the region, they're threatening potential alliances that Muslim countries are going to do want to do with uh, Russia, for example, as an alternative to America, in order to save face with their populations, which now despise the United States of America. Yeah. The United States of America doesn't want to see its flags being burnt. No, that's right. You know, yeah. all across, uh, you know, the United, the Middle East, for example. They don't want to see the, uh, a rise in anti, uh, anti uh, United States sentiments again. That's not something they want to do. So it's not in their best interest. We're saying that if you don't allow the ceasefire, that it will create a rift and a problem in the society. And I think the argument needs to be made in a way that doesn't, that doesn't come across as begging or pleading. Yes. It's actually, we're appealing to your interest. We're saying this is not in your best interest for this to continue. We know you don't care about children's death. Yeah. You can, you can see a million, yeah. you can, I can show you, me and you in our, in our own bedrooms, we can watch the videos of the babies and we can cry and we can be sad about it. But Joe Biden and Justin Trudeau and Rishi Sunak, they can watch a thousand of those videos and not be affected at all. They're, they're looking at the greater interests of their countries and the capitalistic interests and so on. So we have to we have to apply these kinds of logic. So the point I'm making is we're calling for a ceasefire effectively. And we're saying that in the short term, if this is not done, then your status as a superpower is actually going to be questionable. Right. Just like a mother or a father your your status as a guardian is going to be questionable. Your son is overruling you in your home. You're being dominated by your son. Yeah. Who's who's the father and who's the son? You see. Yeah. Because the United States of America is it wants to make sure that the rest of the world knows who's in charge. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And we know this from in history in the 1956 Suez uh, Canal crisis. Um, just a quick one. I mean, for those who don't know, 1956, what happened was that you know the French and the British came into Egypt. And there was a whole crisis relating to a canal called the Suez Canal. And then America wasn't aware of this. And then afterwards, it reasserted itself and it kind of, if you like, maybe threatened, if, if you want to say this, uh, France and Britain that, you know, why are you doing this without my permission? Most historians see this as the turning point in 1956 of the super of the superpower states of the United States of America changing. Yeah. Certainly along with, let's say, 10 years earlier, the dropping of the atomic bombs on Japan, yeah. which was ready to surrender anyway, and they That's knew that. Point. Um, it was purely to establish, you know, the pecking order mm. uh, assigned to the world. Because you were saying before we were having this conversation, you were saying that they had already said that they were... They intercepted, uh, they, they had intelligence had already intercepted communications from Japan. They were on the brink of surrender. Surrendering already. So yeah. they, they, it was overkill. They didn't yeah. require to do no, that. No, 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 not at all. It was just a message to Russia and the rest of the world. Well, this is going to be the new order, right? That's right. That's and right. so look, if this is what you, you want to show the world, that you're in charge, you're not looking like you're in charge right now. Yes.
correct. Uh, this is my my uh, direct communication to the. I'm, I know they're watching this, so I'm saying to you, you know, and this should be the narrative. Yes, you know, Muslim people should carry this over. Yeah, because especially with right wing, I think this really does affect this makes the entire so-called hegemony of the United States of America, the UN, and all these kind of things appear to be a toothless agency, a toothless hegemony. Because at the end of the day, if you can't control your own unruly child in, in Israel and stopping uh, to create an instability in the region, which is going to cost you money, and it's going to cost the American taxpayer money. Four times more money is spent on propping up the Israeli army yes. than is spent on food assistance in yeah. the United States. And these are the arguments that need to start being made because appealing to mercy and compassion has its limitations. Not everyone is merciful. Correct. These people are sadistic. These people are psychotic. They need to be ta ta taught or told or edified that these co these decisions of the lack of ceasefire are going to have consequences which are going to be contrary to the Western interests. Yeah. People are selfish. I mean, uh, well, the reason why I'm putting it in this language, of course, for us as Muslims, I have a different parlance yeah. because I know they're going to be sympathetic. So I will use the sympathetic card. But when I'm speaking to Westerners, I will use the, the language of self-interest. Because if you can't appeal to someone's compassion, you must appeal to their self-interest. Yes. And anybody can use, I was just going to say that I had started writing up an op-ed and the title of which was, uh, Israel is no longer an ally the U.S. can afford. Um, so anybody who's watching is free to steal that and just run with it because yeah. honestly writing into your papers, papers are traditional media. Most people using them are very, very indoctrinated by mainstream media, sort of Zionist, um, you know, account of how things are going, but it's a convincing argument and one that needs to be made. We should have people yeah. that are m Muslims who create accounts with non-Muslim names like Tom Tom or something like yourself, yeah? <laughs> Ricky or something. And infiltrate right-wing um, comment sections. There we go. And these talking points about it being... America first? America first. Right. I think you suggested this. And yeah, I think yeah, it was yeah. a really fantastic. Yeah, I collect them. I, when I see them, I'm like, oh, that's a really interesting. It's a really... You suggest... I, have to, I don't know. I, I'm saying it as if this is my idea. This is your idea, right? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> you tell me about wisdom, it. Wisdom is lost property. Thinking, well, let's get it. Yeah, so this is, I think it's a fantastic idea, bro. No, the, these discursive avenues are really important because it is all about motivating people at the end of the day. And like you said, um, there's a weakness and a lack of dignity in pleading to be recognized by butchers. Exactly. You know, and, and now if somebody has those stated principles, then maybe that's the person, exactly. that's, that's how you appeal. Yeah. But, you know, we can't be, um, we can't be cowards and we also can't yes. be naive. Yes. And this is the real world. You know, these are bombs and guns and weapons and people are dying, right? Yeah, so the objective is ceasefire. The method is the internet and social media. Yeah. And the specific techniques, well, the tactics here, so we're, we're outlining it, we're delineating everything for the, for the troops and yeah, for the comrades, is that some people are going to come with non-Muslim names, infiltrate right-wing uh, places, and make these arguments, which is, why are we going to spend our money? Yeah. 13.1 million dollars a day yeah. i believe why should we spend this on on this uh, why should we do that it's uns this is uh, in, uh, not in the american interest it's not in the english interest let's say the british nationalist or right wing it's not in the french interest or whatever maybe and so on and so forth so that's one angle yeah for the left wing i think there needs to be a completely different kind of approach mm -hmm. and for them it's once again the objective is the same the ceasefire objective in the short term but for them the they are terrified of being labeled as racist yes so to connect the state of israel with racism which is easy because in 1973 they um, they had something called the apartheid convention okay which un apartheid convention and they had eight conditions for what classifies as an apartheid thing one of them was laws which are discriminatory the right of return law in in, in israel is it's actually discriminatory to everyone else but except for Jews. So it says only Jews can come back. Now, according to the 1973 definition of the UN, that that makes Israel um, that makes Israel into an apartheid state. Now, if that's what the the case is, if Israel is an apartheid state, then the question is, how can you support apartheid or not neglect it? Let's say, how can you support it without being a racist? Of course, number it's not one. Possible, yeah. How can you? Uh, not negate it without being an anti-racist. So if they are staying on the fence, if they're supporting Israel, of course, left wings, link wingers don't actually do that usually for the sake of argument, then you can label them with racism. Right. Or or at least show them why they're yeah. going into the direction of or they are racist. And if they uh, don't want to condemn it, then 
make the comparison between apartheid Israel and South Africa and explain to them why that would make them a racist as well. So uh, the point is, play on the sentiment when, when it comes to left wing in terms of tactics and strategies, which relate to racism and labeling. Yes. yes. And if you can, inf uh, you know, influence them directly, then to do that. So we're talking about different strategies for different segments of society. From yeah. the right wing, we have this, the interest, self-interest and taxes and what are we doing with our money? And this, this is this is going to be something effective for them. For the left wing, it's something more like you're racist. You don't want to be labeled as a racist. You do not want to be the person who, uh, for example, stood up against apartheid. What would your grandchild think sure. if they were if they were alive and, and they knew that you didn't speak up against apartheid? Where would you have been if you were in South Africa uh, in apartheid system and so on? So different arguments for different segments. We can't afford to always appeal to mercy. Yes. Although that is a third area because there's a lot of people who are great, good people in the West. I mean, yeah. I'm not saying the West is bereft of anybody, anybody who's who's got sympathetic attitudes. Right. But it's been our only tool that we've been using. Yes. And you can't build a house with just a hammer. Yeah. So it has to be a multifaceted, tactical and strategic online approach. Mm. There needs to be some people who do this, that are listening to this thing right now, some people who do that. And other people who just use the sympathy, show the sympathy that the, the actual child coming out of the rubble. A lot of people, you know, in the West are going to think this is disgusting. Yeah. So part of the sacrifice, you know, a lot of people are, are under pressure from Zionist groups, um, doxing them, right, trying to get them fired from their jobs, trying to get them, you know, pressured in some sort of way. And up until now, we haven't had any ability to fight back on this front. But uh, it seems that you've done something recently. You've started an initiative that's actually going to push back in the other direction. Would you like to, to speak to that a little bit? Yes, we have started an initiative where anyone in the West, English speaking West, who's been uh, attacked by, say, an institution or, you know, a group of people, uh, obviously, this is a legal initiative. It's not a, an illegal one, uh, so not a threat to anyone's life or health or anything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, where the person who feels threatened or feels as if they've been harassed can send their case to a, that email, and we will name and shame these individuals and put them on a website where they can be named and shamed as uh, Zionist propagandist, as uh, anti-Palestinian, maybe even racist, depending on how we brand them based on the evidence right. and it would be good if the, the the people in question have a picture mm -hmm. of the person so it can name and actually shame them by by face save screenshots save evidence yes and so this is part of the fight back uh, in this in this uh, digital war and in fact we will leave uh, an email to be put and maybe in the description box where they can put uh, they can submit their for example their harassments fantastic another tool in the toolbox Right, so absolutely uh, okay well i'd like to to pivot a little bit to uh to another thing part of this um you know watching that particular clip and so many people um have benefited from it uh and being around each other for a bit um mashallah uh you've got an enormous platform okay one could say you know quite a bit of fame um so how do we deal with that how do you as an individual deal with fame? What are the things that, the strategies that you use? Because um, part of part of our sustainability in online DAWA is making sure that our intentions are pure and that we stay away from you know any sort of um, corruption of our intentions. So if there's somebody who's a, a future you, right, that's watching this, um, and they're starting to get involved. For me, I'll, I'll be frank, 9-11 um, was the thing that actually set me off on the path towards accepting Islam. Mm. It was such a, a monumentous thing that happened in the United States. It started getting me questioning things. I looked into things. I have no doubt that this escalation in, in Palestine is going to be the thing that sparks many conversions, what it already has, yeah. and it's going to spark many Muslims to wake up if they haven't been paying attention. Mm. Maybe people are going to get inspired to go study and mm. maybe people are going to get ins inspired to go do dawa, okay? And uh, as somebody who's who is walking the path and has walked the path, and imagine you're mentoring somebody who's who's up and coming. How do you coach them to deal with the fame, to deal with distractions, to stay focused, and to have the biggest impact possible? The fame and money, and power, all three of those things, and maybe you can add the opposite gender as well. But for our, in our case, women, right? But most specifically, let's just say fame, money, and power, for the sake of argument, just for now, are things which you can't really deal with in abstraction. It's like asking the question, how do you learn how to swim? You can't learn how to swim unless you get in the water. Sure. 
So fame is one of those things which, in order to really know how to deal with it, you have to experience it and then develop your own mechanisms of dealing with it. Okay. Vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, the spiritual aspect or vis-a-vis -vis the psychological aspect. If you get somebody who's not famous and not rich or doesn't have any money or has a or is low economic status, let's say, for example, one of the worst things you can do for those people is give them that all in one go. Hmm. And we see this with people who get like win the lottery, for example. Right, sure. And it, it, can, it can really damage their lives because they yeah. don't know what they're doing with it. They don't know how to spend it. They don't know what to do. And then they can fall into depression afterwards. Even professional athletes, some of them are very rags to riches stories. Yes. And then they, they end up with nothing. They end up homeless on the street because yeah. they didn't, you know, went from all from zero to nothing for to zero to a hundred very quickly. That's why Allah says in the Quran. وَلَوْ بَسَطَ اللَّهُ الرِّزْقَ لِعِبَادِهِ لَبَغَوْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ يُنَزِّلُ بِقَدَرٍ مَا يَشَاءُ That if Allah had wanted to get to uh, to give people provisions, or if He gave them provisions all at one go, they would have walked around arrogantly and boastfully, uh, pompously on the earth, but Allah, He gives, يُنَزِّلُ بِقَدْرٍ مَا يَشَاءُ He gives bit by bit. He, you know, He gives bit by bit. He, he gives the provision in piecemeal format. This shows you that fame, how do you deal with it? You learn to deal with it as it comes. I, I didn't, like now I've got millions of subscribers and hundreds of millions, if not, maybe at least half a billion people have seen what I look like maybe right. on the planet. Yeah on the internet, uh, in all languages. And it, this doesn't happen overnight. This happened over a span of 10 years or about nine years. Mm -hmm. So I, Allah, he blessed me with being able to deal with it bit by bit. Um, and so I was able to develop mechanisms. I see. So give us a, an example, like what are some of the mechanisms that you use to, to deal with it? Yeah, so in terms of how inter interaction with people, I, I realized that you have to give each person their time and you have to respect them. Like people have met me. Yeah. None of them will say that I have ever, I've never like, I've never told someone to go away. Right. And that's, that's actually been to my detriment because there's been times where I've stood literally for two to three hours uh -huh. and just take pictures of everyone, shake everyone's hand and listen to every, every single person. Yeah, sure. But the reason why I didn't, I'd never turn anyone away ever. And it's never happens. And it's a policy, unless I'm literally going somewhere with my family. Or, sure, of course. And I have to say, you know, I'm, I'll try and be as nice as possible. It's because I realize that I am representing Islam. And if they connect me with bad attitude, that tragic, that traumatic experience can make them actually swerve away from the religion of Islam. Sure, absolutely. When I was younger, in fact, I was listening to the Dawah. And then there was one particular notable speaker who I went to say hello to outside of a mosque. And he was very, he was very dismissive. That was the mm. word I'll use. He was just dismissive. And that really put, it really hurt me to be mm. honest. Mm. Cause I met that speaker when I became quote unquote famous and he doesn't remember me. Allah. Mm. <laughs> he didn't remember me, but he was being so welcoming. But the point is, why are you being different with me? Because my status has changed. I find that cowardly. Yeah. You know the story of Joha and um, and the robe, huh? Mm. You heard of this story? Mm. Well, Please well, say it yeah, for the people. Yes, yeah, because it's a funny little anecdote and a nice illustration and fable form where uh, Joha was working the fields, okay? And he's dirty and he's got his, you know, his, not his nicest clothes on. And he heard that there's some sort of party going on, okay, that he was invited to. So he rushes, so he's on time and he shows up in his clothes, but he's not in his best form. Yes. Everybody ignores him. Nobody says anything to him. So then he goes back and he cleans himself up, goes to his house, cleans himself up, gets his finest clothes on, perfumes himself, goes back to the party. Everybody's falling over themselves to pay mm. him attention and things like that. So he's sitting down at the dinner table and he starts putting the food inside of his sleeves. And people are staring at him because it's very odd behavior. And then he sells, he tells them basically, essentially, uh, I'm doing that because apparently you didn't invite me to the party. You invited my clothes, mm -hmm. right? And that they're only treating him for his status. And mm -hmm. so it's a common thing. Yeah, it's a fun, but that's a lovely story. Yeah, it's, it's a lovely story. And that is what it is. Uh, people look at, and this is the same thing. So I, I try not to be like this. I hate that, actually. 
I hate that behavior. I, th I find that to be cowardly behavior, disrespectful behavior. Um, and so that's one thing. That's how I deal with it. So that's and actually one of my good friends, uh, one of my one of my best friends and closest friends actually is a Somali brother. Mashallah. Uh, we call him William. That's not his actual name, but I don't <laughs> want to expose him. But one time I was in the streets and I was being almost dismissive. Ah. And he said, "Look, you know, you've got to be much, much more." kind to the people and so I, when he when he realized that i changed my ways and uh, became very very accommodating to him Mashallah. so that's one way that we're, we're talking here about transactional how you act with people but spiritually in terms of fame um do you know like for example literally one this is a good idea uh, you have to kind of because you can get deluded of course. This is a, there's something called psychology of delusion. Okay. To, first of all, to be aware that you can be deluded. Right. Okay. Anyone yeah. can be deluded. And there is a psychology of delusion. Have you ever watched X Factor or Britain's Got Talent or something? You've seen these people a long singing, time ago, yeah. singing and, and they think they're so good <laughs> and they're deluded. That's funny. And then Simon Cowell comes and then he says, you know, you're horrible yeah. and they're shocked and all this kind of thing. Now, what I mean is, I know that if I get reinforcement, uh -huh positive affirmation from a lot of people that that can lead to delusion. I know that this is the Mabda. Mm -hmm. Logically, I understand that. Okay, so is it possible that I could be in an echo chamber and it can delude me? Yes, it is. So how do I temper the delusion through criticism? Right. I, you know, I look at what people say, criticize or whatever, or listen to criticisms of the people mm -hmm. and it actually tempers it and it makes you think, okay, well, this is an over-exaggeration and this is an over-exaggeration. So you start to get kind of like a middle ground approach. Mm, mm. So just to know that you have to be aware not to be deluded because money and fame and these kinds of things can delude you. I know that. I know that very well that, I, you know, that I can be deluded. And so I try and be around people who will tell me that these, these are the things that you need to work on spiritually okay. as well. Being alone. Like we went to Saskatoon, Bro, we went outside in a village, like a village, bro. It's the, it's the most derelict place I've ever been in my entire life. And I sat there. I told the guy to wait in the car, and I sat there for a bit. And I was scared, actually. I said, if I get a heart attack, no one's going to see me. No one's going to know anything. Like anything happens to me. Bro, because like, there was no noise. Yeah. There was no, I saw a farmer driving his car. He was a farmer. I said, what's this guy? What's he doing here? How could he live here? How could anyone live here? You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's, of course. Nice. that's good to be. It's a, going out to a place called Regina. Okay, I've heard of it. I've never been. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it sounds like a very dirty word, but it's not. Uh, <laughs> it's not. There's not what you think. It's called Regina. Yeah. Anyway, so we go going there, and I was sitting in the, and I was thinking, Subhanallah, like you know, what I mean, wow, like this is. I I was actually having a spiritual moment. Mm. I was. Well, I I was thinking, what am I? When I remove everyone else from the equation, I remove millions of people commenting, remove family, remove friends, remove everything, and all I have is Allah. And I look into the creation. What am I? I'm quite insignificant. Yeah, literally, you're insignificant. So when you start looking at big things like mountains and uh, big, huge things, and then you, uh, yani, I came to Canada via Iceland, and I went to a volcano, like a place where the volcanoes. And I kept looking at the volcano, thinking, "I'm I'm very insignificant. I'm very insignificant." And so, when you realize your own insignificance, and and you realize your own insignificance through the grandiosity of the creation of Allah, that tempers the fame thing. It really does. So these are just two things I would say. Excellent. Very beneficial. Thank you for sharing that. Um, some people are going to see this and they're going to be surprised that we're sharing the same platform. Really? I think so because you know. Uh, I'm, I work with the Yaqeen Institute, you're with Sapiens, you know, there's been, um, there's drama in the Taoist sphere sometimes, right? Is this something that, sh that so your reaction, I I'd like to you to expand on that. So it's not a surprise to you. I went to, I went to Ikna or something before and I was sharing the stage with a lot of Yaqeen guys. Yeah, and it's not a surprise for me either. Mm. But for some people who follow your work or my work or both, mm. right, it's a surprise for them. What does that say? 
I don't know. I, I think you'd be surprised that it's not really a surprise. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> I hope so. I hope, yeah, those, those who are surprised are few, fair and few in number. I mean, Alhamdulillah, that's I good. I think most people see us as like pretty, like uh, from what I understand, you, your stances are very similar to, from my from my interactions with you, <laughs> quite similar to each other. So I, I don't see any surprise at all. Like I don't, you know, the only thing that is like, how did you guys get to meet? Well, of course. Like, you know, where did it? But in terms of the institutions and stuff like that, and the Yaqeen, it's not teams like yes. Manchester United or ha, that's or how the whole, that, That's what I, I think some people fall on to. Yeah, if, if Hamza Zorsas came tomorrow and said, look, we're going to change the name of Sapiens to I don't know, Muhammad Hijab's Institute, as it should be called, <laughs> 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 or Hamza Zorsas' Institute or something like that, well, I could change it to whatever you like. Yeah. We don't really care about the names, Yanni. In here, let us smell on some Muha and to Mu'abakum. Yeah, these are just names that you and your father's uh, named. Yeah, and it, so it's about the dawah. Exactly. It's about wh whatever conduit you want to use. And yaqeen has good things in it and bad things. That's my stance. Yes. Like, you know, Ibn, uh, uh, sorry, Malik Ibn Anas, he said that every human being is yu'khadhu man, who you can take something from, and it's refuted. And you can do qiyas on that. Same thing. Every group of people, there's some good and there's some bad. So, yeah. No, I completely agree. And I think I think it's an important education for, hopefully there are few, but if there are people who have this sort of, yeah, city versus united, <laughs> nah, it's not like that attitude or, or whatever it, it mean, is if attitude. it was a matter of that I mean Yaqeen would be out completely out of business I mean if we <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking, yeah, I'm I'm joking. but uh, it's good I mean I think that I do think that we give people an education yeah. when they see us collaborating and mm. they see that we're not exactly the same but we overlap significantly we both have the same goals yeah, I mean, we both have the same well, it's, uh, I don't himma. care about all this stuff I mean like if you if somehow, as, uh, who, who the leaders of Yaqeen are, if they decide to open another organization or this and that, or, yeah, and it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's really, it's, a group is only as good as its individual units yeah, that's or true. members. That's true. And in this case, you know, there's really good members in uh, Yaqeen, really good members in, in, in other places. Yeah, and whatever, you can use, what, even if you just decide I'm not going to be part of, say a organization yeah but i'm gonna work with people yeah you don't i'm not even gonna name anything i don't know whatever just do that simple yeah. as that but i'm gonna work with these couple of guys it says we don't have a name we don't have a, a slogan that we're carrying we're just doing it under islam that's all we're trying to do do you think there's something that in the future that sapiens and yakin could do could do together well, the good thing about not being uh, the CEO or the leader is I don't have to make decisions like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's it. I'm going to take that because, you know, uh, alhamdulillah, but I mean, we've got a very good leader. I actually had a dream recently about uh, about the leadership of uh, Hamza Zorsas. I had the dream about it. And not actually, it wasn't exactly, but it was yani, a car that was driving in the water and it was floating on top of it. And I was on top of the car. Mm, mm, mm. And this was one day before I went and see Piers Morgan. SubhanAllah. Wallahi. I had the dream that I was on top of a big car. Hamza Zorsis was driving it. And I was a bit, a little bit worried because I thought he's going to go like drowning in the water because it's a car going into water. But he floated like a miracle on top of the water. And I was on top of the car. Allah Allah. And then afterwards we came out. This is my dream. And then we came out of the place. And then we saw like a bus with people burning in the yani, inside of it. And we were getting them out of the bus basically. Allah Allah. So I asked somebody, I said, what does this mean? He said that you've got, it's, it's a good, it's a good dream. And it means that, you know, you've got good leadership Mashallah. in the Sapiens Institute and uh, that, you know, you're bringing people out of the hellfire and all this kind of stuff. And it's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's what it is. Akhi. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm very happy with uh, just uh, following orders when it comes to things like this, you know? Yeah, Mashallah. And Hamza is a lovely person. I really connected with him well. We were both in Istanbul together and we we met and uh i got him the promise to join yaqeen institute after uh if i publish an article on feminism oh you're gonna join uh say, well, say again? Oh, bismillah he oh, I, oh. He's, he said yeah. I told him well, he's my, gonna join yaqeen he's, he's, <laughs> <laughs> come on man <laughs> <laughs> but I told him about what I'm working on, and my next up, my, yeah. my next upcoming thing, inshallah, is is a, is a, a thorough academic deconstruction of feminism. Okay. Uh, and when he learns that's that, more of a sapiens thing, right? Uh, maybe there's an overlap there, there. there. I mean, I don't think Yaqeen's ever said anything about feminism, has it? Uh, it has one, but uh, it needs uh, to be updated. And only and pro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, 
<laughs> well, you can you, you can be sure you can be sure that the forthcoming one will not be pro. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, and so you know, he was he was joking, of course, but I I have to hold him to it just for jokes. <laughs> yeah. You know, he said uh, if that happens and when it happens, inshallah, he's like, I will join. And I have to give Amr Suleiman credit uh, for his uh, very brave and courageous stances in the pro-Palestinian yes. cause. Being a Palestinian himself, I'm very proud of his his reach. He's been a key figure as well in the and in, in actually promoting. Uh, you know the poor Palestinian position. Uh, I'm very proud of that. Of that, and the American du'at actually, the compassionate imams. <laughs> I've been good when it comes to the pro Palestine. <laughs> you better be careful hanging out too much with us. Where you're going to catch, catch the compassionate bug as well. <laughs> no, honestly, I have to give him credit where credit is due. Yeah, of course, of course. And all of us, you know, as you said, all of us are on the under the magnifying glass. That's fine. We all have mistakes. We all have shortcomings, yeah, and so we all help yeah, keep each other in check. Especially myself, you know. Yeah, especially myself. Um, but that does bring us full circle to something. You know, how would you respond to, let's say, duaat or imams that they're not really in the game when it comes to taking issues on Palestine or taking issue, taking stances on on these things and helping? Is can we afford? Silence. Can can we afford people to? I think not. This not in this issue. Not in this issue, really. I, I just can't. I just can't see how anyone can. Yeah. You know. I mean, there's no justification of, of this. And uh, actually, it's alim. I I recognize alim not just from his alim and his taqwa, but from the mawaqif, from issues like this. This can make or break alim's career. You can have all the alim in the world. You could have gone to Azhar for 50 years and done this and that and have all these students. But if you don't take a stance on this issue or if you take a negative stance on an issue like this, I'm willing to throw all of that away. I want you to respond to a criticism of, of that stance. So some people will say, for example, that, well, we don't exist as ulama to please the masses or the trolls or the haters. That's a narrative out there. So how would you respond then to that? Yeah, it's, uh, that's uh, you, you exist to speak the truth and, exactly. to, and to and to manifest it. But if you can't, uh, alim who is a coward, yes, for example, or alim who is not willing, because if you're not willing to take a stance at all, there must be a stance. I mean, what is what is going on? Is it neutral? Is it negative? Is it positive? What is it? If you say it's positive, maybe you're working with the enemy. Maybe you're a Zionist. Yeah. Maybe your real name is something Cohen. No. I don't <laughs> <laughs> Or you're compromised. You're compromised in some way professionally. You've yeah. got, you're on the payroll or something. Yeah, or, maybe. You know. But if you take it uh, now a, a, new, a neutral stance, so a negative stance is out of the question. A positive stance is what we want. A neutral stance is, what, but there must be a stance. Yes. So why are you not saying your stance then? Why are you keeping it silent? If you're, there's a lot of sorry to say madkhalis that have actually some of them have been humiliated. One recently actually, uh, I saw a, p a video of one particular. Madhalites in, um, in in Speaker's Corner, being being pressured by by Brother Daniel, uh, yeah, and it was very uh, humiliating actually. Mm -hmm. how, how he was he was he was arguing this Madhalite for normalization. Mm -hmm. He was arguing for it. He was arguing for it. He was, and everyone in the crowd, he rejected it. Right. And this guy's been established in the corner for years. Alhamdulillah. You know, and one masala humiliated him, finished him. Yeah, I, I, it seems to me like um, uh, like a fallacy to say that just because the masses of Muslims support a particular stance means that therefore you're above the fray and you don't have to, and this would be satisfying the trolls. I don't see that as sound logic, though there might be situations where that applies. I don't mm. think that applies in this in this scenario. In fact, I think it showed that um, the moral compass of the Ummah, at least on Palestine, is still intact and alive and oh, beating yeah. and right. Oh, yeah. And it really is, as you said, I think a demonstration rather of character. Because yes, what is. we're saying, I think, is that the ulama are not just the yes. knowledge that you can write down at the at arm's length. Although I will give them some excuse if they're in a country where they cannot say anything. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's different. Like if they if they can if they say something, go to prison. I give them other for that. Sure. But for yeah, I give them some excuse. Other otherwise, to be honest, I don't give them any excuse. Yeah. In fact, this is where we need leadership, right? Yes. Because if we don't, then we cede the leadership to somebody else. Mm. And I think one thing that we've seen is that, particularly with the Palestinian issue, um, that you know the the leadership of that movement has been ceded to secularists and nationalists and leftists and things like that to our own detriment right to our own detriment mm. so um it's a time for bravery and it's a time for sacrifice and it's a time to to step up and and fill the vacuum and lead um so we all work together to that
So may Allah bless you for all your da'wah and may Allah accept from you and from us and um, look forward to continuing our conversations. Thank you so much.